this is many ways to conquer. It's a concurrency talk. Um, I'm Abhinav, and this is functional cont. I work for Flipkart. The colors are terrible over there. <laughs> so, but a lot of uh, work that inspired this talk was done when I used to work for Nil and So. Okay. Anyone recognize what this picture means? The dining philosopher's problem. Uh, it's a in classic uh, concurrency problem. So, um, so when we started getting into functional programming languages, right? So it, it was a hard sell to us that uh, well, not hard, but yeah, it was sold to us saying that functional programming languages are really good for concurrency. They are they have um, they are easy to work with when you're writing concurrent code, right? Um, which is true. Functional programming languages have really nice uh, models of concurrency, which are much better than, uh, in my opinion, uh, fo as found in other imperative languages. But there are a bunch of them, right? And uh, you may not be aware, with, uh, aware of all of them. So this is sort of a survey or an overview or a review talk for uh, about the different kinds of uh, concurrency models across a bunch of uh, functional programming languages. Uh, we're going to talk about Haskell, Erlang, and core async uh, library uh, enclosure. Right. So what is concurrency? Uh, Simon Marlowe says in Parallel and Concurrent Programming in Haskell book that concurrency is a program structuring technique in which there are multiple threads of control which execute in quotes at the same time. So notice that it says threads of control, right? These threads could be actual hardware threads, could be uh, kernel threads or not. It doesn't matter. It's just a concept, right? So uh, the important thing to, no uh, uh, to notice here is that they all execute at the same time. That means that uh, the effects of their execution is interleaved, right? You would see them, a part of thread happening of from this thread and apart from other thread and such, right? And that obviously means that concurrency is non-deterministic. You do not know what part of your code or your thread is going to execute at what time, right? So it's a program structuring technique in the sense that it allows your programs to be modular, right? So imagine writing a HTTP server, right? So you can, if you are using, you have a concept of threads over there, some kind of threads, then you can write the interaction of each request response as a single thread, which is isolated and it's a uh, scope, and you don't have to care about what other requests are going on and such, right? If you don't have threaded concurrency, like you don't have a node, then you have evented concurrency. We have to think about all the events across all the threads, all the requests which are going on at the same time, and then the, your code is not that modular. It's a well-known callback hell problem in JavaScript, right? So what is a thread? A thread is nothing but a sequence of instructions with a context, right? That is the, in, in concept, that's all a thread is, right? So in actual, in the real world, the thread is run by processors and they are managed by schedulers, some kind of schedulers. So in the old times, you used to have single processor systems, then even that, those had multi-threading with time slicing. Now you have multi-process systems or multi-core systems which can execute multiple threads in parallel uh, where each core can execute a separate thread, right? Um, so the kernel scheduler is what schedules these threads, uh, which are called kernel threads, on the um, on the processors, right? But the prop what is the problem with the threads we have as uh, as the kernel threads? The problem is that the threads are pretty heavy, right? The context switch is expensive when you're switching from one thread to another thread, and it, they are difficult to start. Uh, as, as they're, they're, they're slow to start, right? So if you imagine if you have thousands of these threads, then your kernel is doing the bookkeeping for running thousands or probably hundreds of thousands of these threads, and that's all it's doing most of the time instead of doing your actual work, right? So that is what is known as the C10K problem, where the idea is to have 10K concurrent connections on a single machine, right? It's very hard to do that with only native threads, only kernel threads. So in general, you can have some lower thousands of active threads on a single uh, core. What is the solution to this? The solution to this is called green threads. 
I'm sure uh, some of you may have heard about it. So a green thread is scheduled by the runtime of your program uh, or the virtual machine instead of the kernel, right? So the control is in your process, in your code, so to say, or your code's libraries instead of kernel doing it, right? So uh, because of that, you can specialize and you can have green threads uh, which are much cheaper to start and much faster to start. And the context switches are also way faster. I'm not sure, uh, I mean, I'm sure that you have heard uh, about uh, this uh, whole uh, Erlang being able to run hundreds and thousands and millions of green threads in a single VM, right? How? That's how, right? Because the Erlang VM manages these threads and hence it's able to, you know, uh, keep it in a very uh, small space and uh, switch it much faster, right? But there are problems with green threads. One major problem is that if you make a system call in the green thread, then it blocks the thread, right? So your, if to use green threads effectively, you need to support, async, your runtime needs to support asynchronous IO, which Erlang and uh, you know, Haskell and Go and such do. Some, some of them do not, like JVM does not support, it supports asynchronous IO, but it's a bit tricky to get uh, working with asynchronous IO in JVM. And also, uh, green threads, uh, if you like, you do a very simple implementation of green threads, you cannot exploit multiprocessor parallelism in green threads, right? What you need is a more intelligent runtime which can map n number of green threads to m number of kernel threads at runtime intelligently. This is basically uh, the scheduler which will do this. But if you don't have this, then you basically have n number of green threads running on only one kernel thread, and if any one of them blocks, your whole program blocks. Fortunately, Haskell, Erlang, and Core Async support uh, this kind of mapping. So that's why we are going to look at them. So the main focus of this talk will be about around green threads and synchronization of between those threads. Interestingly, where does the name green thread come from? Does anybody know? Why is it called a green thread? Is it more eco-friendly or something? So the name comes from Java. I may not believe it, but the um, one of the first implementations of Java is, uh, com com uh, you know, contained a green thread implementation. It was Java 1.1 and was implemented by a team called Green Team, where green again is not something to do with ecology. It was just like green team, red team, blue team, and the green team just happened to implement green threads and the name stuck. So now it's called green threads everywhere. So when you have threads, I don't know if you can see the Im image behind, but this is outer ring road, right here. <laughs> so when you have multiple threads, you sometimes need to synchronize between them, right? If you never need to synchronize, you're well and good, but that's not how real world is, right? You need synchronization very often. So what is synchronization? Synchronization is the process by which threads agree on something, on something, some thing or other, right? Agreement as in conquer, and hence the name of the talk, right? So that something could be like, you know, if you have a thread starting another thread or a thread waiting for another thread, which basically called forking and joining of threads, then you have a concurrency problem there. If you have a variable which is accessed by multiple threads at the same time, right, then you have a concurrency problem because you do not want concurrent access to the threads, uh, to, the va to the variable, right? You may have a sequence of steps which you want to execute in one particular order, but if you let multiple threads execute them together, then you may have interleaving and so it all gets corrupted. So you need to protect these steps with some sort of uh, synchronization. You may have uh, shared resources like a database handle or HTTP connection or a TCP connection or whatever to which you do not want to write concurrently because it will corrupt the downstream um, resource. So that's also a synchronization problem. So how do we solve synchronization problems between thread, right? So all th threads in a particular process share memories, share memory addresses. So it's very easy to use memory itself, shared memory, to implement some sort of locking mechanism, right? So locks are used to prevent concurrent access to the critical sections like a sequence of steps or critical memory like a variable or a resource, shared resource, right? But the problem with locks is that they do not compose. 
when you have n number of resources where n may or may not be known beforehand, then locks are difficult to work with. I'll show an example later. But uh, the problem is that you have to lock, if you have multiple, you're working with multiple locks, then you have to get the locks in the right order at the right time, and also you have to unlock them in the right order at the right time to make sure everything works perfectly. Otherwise, you'll have issues like deadlock where you have two resources waiting for each other's lock, or starvation, right? And a bunch of other kind of concurrency issues, right? So it's very easy to get them when you're working with multiple resources with locks, right? So what is the solution? The solution is, well, you ditch locks, lock-free but still shared state concurrency, as implemented by software transactional memory and communicating sequential processes. Or you ditch shared state itself, no shared state, as implemented by actor model, right? So with that, let's uh, jump into the first one, actor model, right? I'll take questions after the presentation, so I'll just uh, have a lot to talk about. What is an actor? So an uh, actor is actually pretty simple in its definition. An actor is a thing which can create new actors, can send messages to actors, other actors, or maybe itself, and can receive messages and do something. That's it. That is all an actor is, in essence, right? Uh, how is it implemented by Erlang? So you see here the circles are actors, right? And the envelopes are messages. So actors are sending messages to other actors. Right? So there is something called mailbox over there. Right? So first of all, what is an actor? An actor is nothing but just a green thread, as we talked about. Uh, Erlang calls them processes for some reason, but they are nothing but just a green thread uh, implemented by the Erlang VM. Uh, each actor has its own mutable state, but only that particular actor has access to that state. No other actor can access that state. Right? That's what is the isolated state over there at the bottom. The only thing that actors can do is send messages to each other, right? And messages are immutable. The, you cannot change a message after creation, creating a message. And when you send a message, when one actor sends a message to another actor, then it lands up in the other actor's mailbox. It is very similar to how email behaves, right? You send emails to each other, it, be, it lands up in the other person's mailbox. They go and check their email, and then they reply to you or not, or spam, market spam or something. So. Uh, that's how it works in uh, with actors also, right? So all you do is send messages to e each other, and it lands up into other actors' mailbox, and then the other actor can decide to read it whenever it wants, right? In whatever order they want, right? And then when they read a message, they can update their own state, like you know, I read an email, and like you have a meeting at 5 p.m., and I like I put it in my head, or something like that, right? So I update my state to reflect the message I got. I can also send another message saying, hey, I'm not coming to this e meeting or something like that, right? Uh, and that's pretty much all I can do. That's all an actor can do, right? Uh, uh, of course, it can do I.O. and other stuff, but I'm not going to talk about that part here. Uh, so the only way to communicate between actors is messaging. There is no other way. There are, there are no locks. There is no shared memory, nothing. You just send messages to actors. And in our lang, everything is an actor. Literally, everything is an actor. If you open a file to, if you open a file to read, then an actor is created for that also, which will read the file and send you chunks of file as messages. In a simplistic way, right? So everything is an actor in our lang. Uh, so let's see some code examples, right? Tell me if it's not visible from the back. Uh, yeah, it was big reveal. So this is a very simple actor, right? Uh, the actor is an echo actor. You just send it, send it a number and you just print it. Or you can send it a quit message and it'll just die, right? So it's implemented as a recursive function. You see the loop function calls itself at the end in the um, num line, right? So what it does is a receive call, a call. So when you say receive, the actor picks up a message from its mailbox. That's how you get mails or get messages, right? And then you can pattern match. This is pattern matching over here. It's matching it against two possible patterns. 
I am sure you have seen pattern matching in some FP language or other. So if it's a quit message, it just says bye and does not call itself, and in effect, it dies. If it gets something else, then it says received blah, it prints it there, and then call itself, calls itself, and then goes on a loop forever till you send it a quit message. So this is the part where actors receive messages. How do you start an actor and send the message? That's also very simple. You call the spawn function with this function, right? Uh, a language is a functional language. You have functions as first class entities. So you say uh, spawn loop, and you get back what is called a process ID, PID, right? That is how you reference actors or processes in our line, right? So then you can send messages to the process ID. See, uh, sending messages just bang. It's very simple in our line. You just say process bang whatever x number and it, 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 it prints that number because it received it in the receive section over there, right? Very simple. Then you send it quit and it says bye and it dies. That's it. That's actor 101 in I don't know, seven, eight, ten lines. Right. So actors are nothing but simple functions, right? And they just keep repeating themselves, keep picking, picking messages from mailbox and doing something, right? And when a receive is called, uh, actor calls a receive, and the mailbox is empty, then what the Erlang VM does is that it just like sidelines that actor saying, hey, you don't have anything to do now, go sleep. And when a message arrives again, then the Erlang VM knows that a message has arrived for this actor. It'll wake it up saying, hey, you have a message now. And then your receive function will uh, finish, and you'll get the message at that line. Right? So that's how an actor works with the help of the scheduler. Right? Let's look at a more complicated example. That actor did not have a state. Right? I was talking about a state, stateful actors. How is state implemented? So let's write a counter actor. Very simple uh, loop over there. But now this time it has a parameter. And that's it. That is the state of the actor. You start an actor with an initial parameter, which is the initial state. And then it calls itself with a new, act, new state. So I, if I send it an inc message, right, which is increment, then uh, where is my cursor? It's somewhere. So I, if I send it an inc message, then what it does, it just calls itself with n plus 1. And you have done an increment, increment in the state. That's it. So Shared, there is no shared state, and state is nothing but just the parameter of the function, right? The other function is the get function, which is how you get the counter of value of a counter. If you have a counter, you can't get its value; it's pointless, right? Or countless. So you start the counter as earlier, right? This time with, oops, sorry, this time with an initial value which is zero. You send it inc. That code activates; it increments the state to one. And then you say get self. What is self? Self is how a process gets its own ID. Remember when I said uh, everything is a process, even the shell in which I'm writing this code it's a, is a process. So if I call self in the shell, I get the process ID of the cell shell itself. So the shell sends its own process ID to the counter, and the counter will message it back. As you see over there, it's sending the sender a message with the value, and then recur. That's it. So that is how you get the values out of actors. Actors cannot send you messages unless they know your process ID. Actors are anonymous in that sense. There are ways to name them also, but I'll not talk about that. Right. So I, uh, so uh, apparently, uh, I know it seems like I, the shell should have received a message, but what, where is it? I call receive in the shell itself to print the message. And of course, it works. It prints one. The shell did receive a message. But what if the shell sends a wrong message? I sent a wrong message to the actor, get x. There is no handler for get x. What will happen now? If I call a receive in the shell, it will wait forever. Because that's how actors work, right? If the mailbox is empty, the receive blocks. Obviously, they thought about it. And you can call receive with a timeout. You can say, I, I'm willing to wait for 1,000 milliseconds. If I do not receive a message, I'm going to do something else. That's it. So a timeout happens in this case, and you the shell resumes. Right? So that is how you implement um, a stateful actor. So this is very simplistic view of uh, actors. There are obviously more things. There are supervision hierarchies and actor monitors. And Erlang gives you a lot more than just this much. 
product, right? But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is an actor in our line, right? How is it implemented? Turns out an actor is nothing but just a piece of memory, a block of memory. And it looks very similar to a kernel thread, so to say, right? You have a process control block. You have a stack, you have a heap. The stack has parameters and return address and such. Very similar to how it's implemented in kernel. And then you have a heap which has a special thing which is mailbox, right? So a mailbox is nothing but a piece in a part of memory in an actor's heap. And when one actor sends message to another actor, they just literally copy the message data from their heap to the other heap. That's it. Right, so um, actor A copies its message into actor B's memory and then marks its own message as deleted which gets collected by GC. So that only one copy of message exists, it's uh, at, one, at one time in just one actor, right? Unless you explicitly copy and send it across and stuff. So that ensures that the messages are not corrupted when they are being sent from one actor to another. You cannot alter a message while after sending it, for example. When the copying happens, you have a small piece uh, where a lock is acquired to put uh, the copy of the message in the mailbox. But uh, there are com more complicated algorithms also implemented in Erlang which can do this without locks, right? Uh, which involves GC doing a part of work for cleanup and such. So that's how an actor is implemented in Erlang, right? So that's it for the Erlang part. Uh, let's talk about what is good about actors, right? So you do, communication itself is synchronization. If you say a call receive, you block. You don't need any special locks or any sort of stuff for that, right? No need. You don't need to worry about uh, mutual exclusion because the states are isolated in each actor. They cannot access each other's states, right? And it models distributed systems very well. And it also distributes very well. Erlang has built-in transparent distribution of actors and such, right? The bad side is it can be slower compared to st shared state concurrency with locks and such. Um, it is difficult to do multi-entity consensus as in distributed transactions or even two-actor transactions, right? If you want to do, you want to synchronize, th there is no easy way to say that this, a bunch of actors should do same thing at uh, one particular time. There is no uh, the easy way to do that. You have to model distributed transactions using complicated algorithms like possibly raft or something like that, right? Distributed consensus inside uh, actors, which has already been done, but sure, right? And if you do not consume messages, if the actors do not consume messages fast enough, their ma mailbox overflows and they die, right? Out of memory. So these are a bunch of problems with the actors. Let's move on to the next section, software transactional memory. I'm going to run a bit faster now. Uh, so what is software transactional memory, right? So a software transactional memory or STM allows you to do, as I just said, actors cannot do distributed transactions well. That's exactly what STM gives you, distributed transactions. It lets you change multiple mutable variables together in a single atomic operation, right? That gives you atomicity, as in like the, all of the changes to these n, act, n variables become visible to every other thread at the same time, or they don't, right? Which is isolation, right? So one operation is completely unaffected by other operations. It's as if you uh, take a snapshot at the beginning and then just work on the snapshot and it's independent of all other snapshots, all other threads doing some other transaction on those variables at the same time, right? So. Let's see how Haskell implements STM. There's a data type called STM, uh, parameterized by type A, which also implement, happens to implement monad uh, type class, which gives you a lot of convenience functions. And this is the core of STM, a TVAR, T for transactional. This is a transactional mutable variable, right? You can create a new TVAR, you can read a TVAR, you can write a TVAR, but you can should notice that all of these things happen in the STM type. It's not IO. Right, mutable things in Haskell are generally associated with I/O. In this case, it's not I/O. It's a special type called STM, right? And so you can do multiple of these things together. But how do you actually do them? For that, you have 
a function called atomically. It takes an STM block, which can have multiple STM operations, and does them atomically. That's what it does. Right? So it either gets done at the same time or not done at the same time. Right? There are a bunch of other things uh, which I'll explain later. So to explain this, let's look at uh, an example. This is a classic trans uh, concurrency example where you have two accounts, you want to transfer money between them. Uh, it could be happening in reverse order at the same time concurrently. Then how do you make sure that it's all working fine? Let's look at some Java code with locks. Right? This is an account which has an ID and an amount. And if you want to do a withdrawal, obviously you'll put a lock around it so that no other withdrawal is done at the same time. Right? Otherwise, you'll end up with weird amounts. And deposit is very simple. You just withdraw with a negative amount. right? And then you would think, OK, now I can write transfer very simply. I just withdraw from this and deposit into the other one, and I'm done. Wrong. It's, uh, it'll not work because you are not locking the accounts in a deterministic order. right? So it can happen that if the two concurrent transactions are happening in reverse directions, then account A gets locked by the withdraw function, and the account B gets locked with the withdraw function at the same time. And then they wait on each other to be unlocked, and it never happens, and it's a deadlock. To fix this deadlock, the very simple solution is to lock, acquire the locks in deterministic order. right? So how do you, determine, uh, how do you order them? You use some sort of uh, you know, uh, characteristic of the account, in this case, the ID. So you check, you compare IDs, and then you lock in the order of IDs, in the uh, first the smaller ID, and then the larger ID. right? Otherwise, you lock it in the other order. right? So that is the locking part. And then you have to unlock in the same order. But even then, you cannot reuse the withdraw or deposit function because they release the lock internally. You cannot remove locking from there also because you may have just a withdrawal instead of a transfer. right? So you need to rewrite that code here to do this thing. And this is how it ends up looking. And this is just code for writing, transferring amount between two accounts. What if you have three accounts? What if you have unknown number of accounts? Right? What if you are eBay or PayPal? Whatever. And what if you want to have like uh, overdraft accounts? Like if you don't have this money in this account, then you get money from that account. Cannot do those things with Java, with locks like this. How does it look like in Haskell? You have an account, which is just a transactional variable with an integer amount. Withdraw is very simple. Notice that everything is happening in uh, STM uh, monad. So read the, uh, read the balance, then uh, reduce the balance, write down the, ba uh, write down the new balance. Right? That's it. Deposit is still just the opposite of withdrawal. And in this case, transfer is actually that code that we wanted to write in Java. Deposit, withdraw. That's it. Because it's running in STM with the atomically function, it'll make sure that it happens without any errors. It will not cause any deadlocks. It will never uh, leave a corrupt state ever. Right. That may seem like magic, but we'll come to the internals in a minute. And then a final uh, function to get the amount in, uh, in the account, and which is also used atomically. Right. So let's see how this is actually. Um, uh, used. Oh, by the way, this is the whole Haskell code. This is smaller than the whole <laughs> half the size of the Java code. So you create two accounts, right? Again, using atomically. This is happening in I/O. You do a transfer, and then when you do, when you print these amounts, it'll always say 150, 150. You transferred 50 from 200, 200, and it'll always be like that, right? There will never be a case when it's different. So how does it work, right? So is it visible? It's a bit uh, unreadable from here, maybe. Uh, I'll just explain. So you have, say if you have a transaction running, right? So when a transaction starts, right? So the first time a TVAR is read within a transaction, it will cache or it will copy its value to a local cache known as transaction log, right? So you read a variable A, X in this case. Uh, some of these say a and x, it should all be x. That's my mistake. So if you read a variable x, right, it gets cached into the transaction log. And then you the rights to the variable x will go to the same cache. 
and at the end when you are finishing the transaction you would do a commit when you do a commit right do uh, then at that time stm will compare the value of x that it has in the log in that cache with the actual value which is there right now so if it's same it just commits and everything is fine right if another transaction a shorter transaction has happened between which has changed the value of x in between then your commit fails at that point and then what stm does it just restarts the transaction that's it and th ha this may happen multiple times if you have a really long transaction and a lot of short transactions breaking it but it'll work fine it'll all eventually give you the right answers right if you have uh, multiple variables which you read and write even then it'll work fine because it will match the value of every variable before committing and if it anything is wrong it will abort the commit right so at the time of commit there is a short lock which is held but that is only place where lock is held and that and then the values are uh, changed by a keyword cache or something which may be a architecture specific mechanism right so this is safe to do you may imagine you may think that oh, what if it's retried many 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 times that's okay because of the type system the strong type system that haskell has it makes sure that uh, you there are no side effects right you cannot do io inside stm there are two different data types there are two different monads so you cannot write code which say sends an sms when this transfer is happening and that sms gets sent twice or thrice it will not happen because you cannot do that by the uh, like you know enforced by the type system right so let's uh, i'm going to actually skip over these slides because i'm running out of time we can see them later these are uh, so the, the transaction cha uh, transaction variables can be implement used to implement a transactional channel right a transactional channel can be again has the same features of transactional variable except it is multi -val va valued right so like a queue instead of just one variable you have a queue of variables which you can again read write atomically and such right you can read a test channel you can write to a channel and everything is atomic and because of transactions uh, well i did not talk about this previous thing over there which is um, or else or else is a way to merge two stm transactions he says that do this if it fails as in failure as i showed in the previous slide the commit fails then do that so this lets you read from multiple channels at the same time atomically you say read from this channel or else read from that channel and only one of these channels will be read that is ensured by stm right so um a uh, so this these these are channels in uh, stm and they are actually very simple to implement right you can write implementation yourself an stm channel is nothing but a linked list of stm t vars that's it so if you have a t var which points to an item the item points to the next t var the next t var points to the next item and you tail uh, keep a head and a tail t var that's it this is all for implementing transactional channels in haskell right so uh, to conclude uh, pros are you have composable atomicity and blocking right you can compose them in any order uh and it'll all work fine there is no need to worry about locking order and such right the type system of haskell will prevent all sorts of side effects it's not possible to do that and with t chans you can create uh, data flow programming uh, sort of like assembly lines and such to do say etl or similar sort of stuff right uh, i'll not go into details over there but yeah the cons are that the transactions which touch many 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 variables many t vars are expensive that's because at the time of commit you actually have to go over all the t vars and make sure that they are you know correct right so if you read 100 t vars then your transaction will be slower if you read an unbounded number of t vars it, your transaction will ne may never finish right so you should never read unbounded number of t vars in a transaction a long running transaction may re, re execute again and again because some short running transaction may cause it to be aborted right as we saw in that slide so if you have a transaction which is very long running it's very probable that it will get aborted again and again so you should not do very long running transactions either right so that is it for sql stm i have 10 minutes i'm going to run through the last slide last part which is 
communicating sequential processes as implemented by core async in Clojure. Right? So, what is CSP, communicating sequential processes? You have independent threads of activity. Notice there, th I am called them threads of activity. They, in case of Hask in case of Clojure, they are not green threads. Clojure does not have green threads because it's on JVM, and JVM does not support green threads anymore, right? But they are independent, and communication between um, the threads uh, is done through channels, as uh, we talked about earlier. But the communication in this case is synchronous, right? I'll explain what how it works, and you can multiplex channels, as in you can combine them using alteration. So let's see what uh, CSP is. Uh, so you have three processes here, one, two, and three. So one and two are, are using the same channel to communicate. So one reads the value from channel one, uh, some channel, right? Process one reads the value from a channel, but the channel is empty, so it blocks at that point. And at later time, process two writes the value to the same channel, and then the process one unblocks and it gets the value. So the channel itself is used for synchronization between these two threads. Similarly, if you write before the channel is, uh, uh, so if you write before, then it, you, the, the, like as process two writes first and then process three reads later, in between process two blocks again. So both read and write to these channels are synchronization points. And that is how you synchronize between threads. You don't need locks or anything. It just read, waits, wait on the channel, so to say, right? When you're reading or writing. Let's look at some quick code in closure. So go is how you start one of these threads in Clojure, right? So go print high, you'll just start a new thread of activity. Clojure calls them IOC threads for some reason. Uh, so and it'll print it, right? Creating a channel is very easy. You create a chan channel like this, it, give it a name. And then you say go print, It's up, you read it inside out. So you take a value from the channel, print it, and this part you are running in a go thread, right? But this will block, as we just saw in the previous diagram. Because the channel is empty, there is nothing in there. So this go thread will block there. But at a later time, you put some value in the go thread, uh, sorry, in the channel, in another go thread, and the first, the previous go thread will resume and will print hello, right? There's also a way to create buffered channels, where you give some buffer there. You don't have to block immediately when you're doing a read or write. But it will eventually block after the buffer expires, right? How do we do multiplexing of channels? As in, like I talked about STM, you can read uh, from multiple channels atomically. How do you do that? So if you have three channels, right? I start one go thread, and each one of them, I'm trying to read from all the channels at once using the alts function over there, right? So what alt does is that it'll read value, a value from a channel, one of the channels, right? It'll give you the value in the channel as well, which channel it read it from. But it'll read it only from one channel and not any other. This is again something like uh, closure STM where it's done atomically, right? So if you have three values in each channel, only one particular channel's one particular value will be read and other channels will stay untouched, right? So again, this will not print anything because the channels are empty. But at some later time, I put some values in the channel. Then it will print those values. But this may come out in any order because there is no guarantee of uh, you know, which order the alts run in. Right? It's non-deterministic. Right? So that is a very, very short introduction to channels in closure. Uh, let's see how it works. Right? I have five minutes. Uh, we have to extend, let's see. So this is a very simple code there. You have a go block in which you say if x equal to true, uh, x equal to one, you run two else false. That's it. And then you macro expand it because go is a macro. And then you run this pass to state machine function, which is which actually comes with core async. This is how core async works. So what it does is that it takes this small bit of code and it converts it into this. Completely unreadable, but it's all generated code using macros, right? So how does it work? So core async is based on what are called deep walking macros. Deep walking macros recursively walk through your entire code 
and transform them. They are like compilers, right? They'll walk through your whole code and then transform it into some other form, right? In this case, in case of core async, this form happens to be a state machine, right? So it takes this very simple looking code and makes a state machine out of it. If I zoom, which I can't, uh, you would see there are functions there which are named like state machine and such, right? So what it does is transforms it to a state machine. So the state machines, um, so and, and now you have the state machine and what do you do? So the, you run the state machine, which is what the Go threads are. So Go threads actually run on kernel threads. They run on the kernel threads which Java provides to the closure runtime. And when they encounter a blocking operation, like putting into a channel or getting from a channel, those are the only blocking operations, uh, basic blocking operations in core async, right? So when you, you put a, into a channel, or you get into a channel, uh, as uh, described, as shown in the previous slide, you, you're supposed to block there. Your thread is supposed to block and yield so that some other thread can run, right? But how does it work in core async? This is a slide stolen from the Richiki, from Richiki's uh, closure core, core, core async internal stock. So this is the internals of the channel. Interestingly, in core async, the threads are not the interesting part. The channels are the interesting parts. So what happens is that when uh, you do a blocking operation on a channel, the entire state of your Go thread, the stack the lo uh, with the local variables, the function reference, the state, uh, the current state in the state machine, the state to resume at, everything is put into an array, a Java array. It's wrapped into a callback and the callback is pushed into the channel's internal queue. You see, this is the last example over there. When you're doing a put and your channel is full, you can't see the colors over there, but the la last case is where the channel is full then it gets put into a queue inside the channel, right? And then when the corresponding resume event happens, for put it's take and from for take it's put, then the last case you see, so as soon as a take happens, there is a space created in the queue and the handler runs and the code resumes. Because the whole of your code state was put into an array and stuffed into that other array, <laughs> right? So all of core in, uh, async internals are nothing but arrays, lots of Java arrays, right? So that's that's how it works, and it gives you an illusion of green threads, but they are not green threads. They run on kernel threads. They just, you know, pack and pack state into arrays again and again and again, and it's written in a very very clever way so that it can work with green threads, as in Go threads, or kernel threads. And it can even work with in JavaScript in closure, uh, uh, closure script. A closure script can compile core uh, async to work on JavaScript as well, where there are no uh, threads at all. So it's a very you know fabulous uh, implementation of uh, uh, CSP, but I, I don't have time to get into the details, right? Yes, this is the last uh, slide. So the pros are that core async is just a library. There's no special runtime needed like Erlang or Haskell or Go or something. You can uh, do uh, data flow programming very easily in core async because the library comes with lots and lots of combinators. They have map, filter, join, fork, pipeline, blah, blah. Huge amount of uh, convenience functions to create uh, data flow programming. And it works on JVM and on browser, right? And it's especially very nice on browser. The cons are, if you do I.O., blocking I.O. in green threads, it blocks them, right? As I talked about, like, green threads uh, will block if you do blocking I.O. in them, and Clojure does not have non-blocking I.O. by default. You can do non-blocking I.O., but it's a bit tricky, right? And error handling is complicated. In Java, you have exceptions, and if you throw exceptions inside a Go thread, you don't know what will happen. It's just all, like, gets corrupted, right? So that's it I have for uh, the very short talk. The learnings are green threads are really, really nice, right? You can run huge amount of uh, load using green threads. Uh, if you use these higher level concurrency models, then it decompletes your code. It makes it easier to reason about and such. And different techniques are suitable for different situations, right? There's, these are some references, mostly uh, books and uh, talks. Um, and that's it. Thank you.
I can duck catch up with me and talk like